815 Millionen. So viele Menschen leiden gegenwärtig Hunger. 2300 Milliarden US-Dollar. Das ist die Summe, die der Westen je nach Berechnung bis anhin zur Armutsbekämpfung ausgegeben hat. Ein bescheidener Erfolg, sagen die einen. Immerhin sinken Hunger und Mangelernährung, sagen die anderen. Meine Gäste sagen, man kann es besser machen. Sie sind aus den USA zu uns gekommen, die Ökonomieprofessoren Esther Duflo und Avicit Banerjee. Am MIT in Boston haben sie ein Forschungszentrum gegründet, das die Armutsbekämpfung mit sogenannten randomisierten Studien neu erfindet. Damit sind sie sehr erfolgreich, doch sie müssen auch Kritik einstecken. Und darüber diskutieren wir jetzt. Ganz herzlich willkommen. Ja, Frau Duflo, viele Leute helfen, aber Sie sagen, man kann es besser machen. Was machen Sie anders? I guess what we are trying to do differently is uh, we are not trying to put ourselves in the position of just helping. Okay, let me build an orphanage or feed some children. Uh, we are more trying to be in a position of understanding uh, what are the problems that uh, poor people face in their lives and what are possible solutions and what, have, what solutions people in various quarters in developing countries themselves uh, have thought about. And then we are trying to test those solutions mm -hmm. rigorously. Das ist ja eigentlich eine Selbstverständlichkeit. Bevor man hilft, versucht man mal herauszufinden, was die Leute überhaupt brauchen. Treffen Sie denn in Ihrer Arbeit immer noch viele Hilfswerke an, die einfach mal irgendwas machen, ohne wirklich hinzuschauen, was die Bedürfnisse sind? It's not so much that they don't look at what the needs are. I mean, they're, not, they're, they're entirely sensible people, but they're often messages that go down from somewhere which they pick up and they follow it. And that might be that, you know, you, you should not, uh, I don't know, to, for example, uh, you, know, you should not give children um, you know, the things that, you know, the, the, that they suck on because that might discourage breastfeeding. So they, they, they have all kinds of stories that they believe in, and many of them have no particular basis in reality. It's not that they're not trying. Mm -hmm. It's just that, to, like we uh, try, we try to inform our decisions with science. And I think part of it is that lots of pseudoscience around, and people are often influenced by the pseudoscience. Mm -hmm. Und ein Mittel, was Sie anwenden, ist die sogenannte randomisierte, kontrollierte Studie. Das ist eine, ein Studiendesign, das nachweislich eigentlich das beste Studiendesign ist, um die Wirksamkeit einer Methode zu testen. Wir kennen das aus der Medizin, wenn man beispielsweise ein Medikament auf seine Wirksamkeit hin prüfen möchte, dann wendet man solche randomisierten Studien an. Wir haben ein Beispiel mitgebracht aus Ihrer Arbeit, und zwar ein Versuch, bei dem es um ein Impfprogramm ging in Udaipur in Indien, wir sehen hier die Punkte, die aufploppen. Das sind die Dörfer, die getestet worden sind. Frau Duflo, mögen Sie kurz erklären, was haben Sie hier gemacht? Was sind diese Punkte? Ja, yes, so the, the idea of randomized controlled trials is that if you want to know whether something makes a difference, you really need to try to compare apples with apples. And in general, in life, you're not really comparing apples with apples because, for example, a particular program was put in a particular village because it's very, very poor. Therefore, if we compare this village to another village, of course, we see this village is doing very poorly, but precisely because it's very, very poor in the first place. Or conversely, you might choose a village that, where the leader is very enterprising. So when you compare this village to another one, You see this village doing better, but it's not because of your program, it's because that person is particularly enterprising. So what you're doing with randomized controlled trial is that you are uh, avoiding all of these problems by creating a situation where you're comparing apples with apples. So what you have on the map here are villages in Udaipur district, which is a poor uh, tribal district in Rajasthan, very beautiful for people who mm -hmm. have uh, gone visit. And what we did is that we wanted to test the effectiveness of a program where people would get either a, a very nice camp where they can bring their kids to get immunized, or that plus a kilo of lentils when they bring the child to get immunized as a reminder to do it. And what we did is that we worked with an NGO. We, we, we took the entire list of villages where they work, and then we randomly selected 
The white villages are comparison villages where we didn't do anything else. And then we picked like completely randomly. That means with a throw of a mm -hmm. dice or with dart on a board. <laughs> uh, the green villages where, we, uh, where they run the ammunition camps and the uh, red villages where, in addition, they gave the lentils. So now we can be sure that all these villages are the same. And then we collect data in all the villages for about a year in this case. And then we can see really whether what made a difference, whether the camp make a difference compared to the usual business as usual of going to the clinic as normal and whether the lentils add to that. Und manchmal, äh, da denkt man ja vielleicht zuerst, na ja, so überraschend ist das nicht. In der Schweiz ist es immer so, wenn es etwas umsonst gibt, dann rennen die Leute dahin. Das ist das System, was viele äh, Warenhäuser anwenden. Man gibt noch etwas gratis, dann gehen die Leute dahin. Aber es gibt auch sehr überraschende äh, Momente in diesem Buch, äh, Poor Economics, das Sie gemeinsam geschrieben haben. Es gibt zum Beispiel ein Beispiel, das mich sehr äh, beeindruckt hat. Eine Studie, die Sie gemacht haben für UNICEF, da gab es ein Programm, da hat man versucht, Mädchen quasi zu motivieren, länger die Schule zu besuchen und nicht so früh schwanger zu werden. Was sie gesehen haben, ist, es nützt gar nichts, einfach nur gratis Schulunterricht anzubieten und Aufklärungsprogramme zu starten, sondern sie haben gesehen, dass diejenigen Mädchen, die eine Schul Schuluniform erhalten, gehen länger zur Schule, weil sie stolz sind auf diese Uniform, weil sie was gelten im Dorf und dann infolgedessen eben bereit sind, nicht so früh schwanger zu werden. Und das fand ich überraschend, dass mit einer Schuluniform so eine große Differenz dann erzielt wird. Gibt es noch andere Beispiele, wo Sie gesagt haben, das war so richtig eine Studie, wo wir gedacht haben, Mensch, das ist jetzt wirklich bahnbrechend? To be honest, the one that we just looked at, the one in Udaipur, I mean, we, we thought that, I mean, and not just we, we talked to a lot of experts. Before we do anything, we talked to lots of people in the area. And everybody's view was that, look, you know, either it has to be that the delivery system has to improve. And you know, that's a big improvement. The small improvement might be if you give something some thing for free, maybe the pe extra people will come. In fact, the data shows the opposite, which is that the really big improvement comes when you give people the little incentive that when you come get your children immunized, we'll, get, we'll give you a kilo of dried beans. That had the very big effect. The smaller effect came from improving the delivery system. So this was like, and this was collective wisdom. We talked to many, many people, and they were all happily giving us this advice. We just happened to try out this extra thing, and it turned out that that was the really, the, what really turned, turned the thing around was that. Mm -hmm. Das heißt, Sie würden mir nicht zustimmen, dass das ein, ein, eine kleine Erkenntnis ist, sondern es war eigentlich eine große Erkenntnis für Sie. I mean, Small, big, this is, to us, it was a big insight. Yeah, you, yeah. you can decide yeah. what you feel, but yes. Also, was ich auch sehr interessant fand, ist, dass Sie immer wieder sagen, Sie stoßen in Ihren Feldstudien, Sie gehen ja dauernd in diese Länder, Sie sprechen mit diesen betroffenen Menschen, Sie sitzen nicht einfach am Schreibtisch und rechnen irgendwas, Sie sind ja Ökonomen, sondern Sie gehen ins Feld. Und Sie sagen immer wieder, stoßen Sie eigentlich auf irrationales Verhalten, also für Sie als Ökonomen irgendwie irritierend. Und es gibt ja auch Momente, in denen viele Menschen in reichen Ländern irritiert reagieren. Ein berühmtes Beispiel ist das Fernsehgerät bei sehr armen Familien. Und da sagen Sie auch als Ökonomen, ja, manchmal verstehen wir es nicht so recht, aber Sie verteidigen das Fernsehgerät im Slum. Yes. Yes, there is no... I, I, the, the question is not so much uh, being irrational or rational. In many instances, um, people in rich countries are also irrational. I think structurally, as human beings, we have blind spots. And the poor don't have many more blind spots than the rich. It's really the, the, often the same thing, or often the poor actually are much more rational on some dimensions and much less on others. But uh, as human beings, we all have, are reasonably rational and we also have limits to this rationality that people understand better and better. Lass But in the case of... Ganz kurz fragen, nur ganz kurz dazwischen. Was heißt für Sie rational als Ökonomin? Yes, so that's, that's exactly where I was trying to go. That's a great question, which is, that's what we have to think about. Rational, I guess, is uh, being effective at reaching the goals uh, that you set for yourself. Mm -hmm. So someone who is irrational is someone who does something that is uh, against their self-interest as understood by this person themselves. So the example of TV is really an example where someone was being absolutely rational 
and where we coming, you know, foreigners, rich people, just misunderstand what they really want and what they really need. In the case of the television, this person that we met that had the television, he had been saving for years to get the television. So it's not something that he went into a shop and on impulse he bought a television. It's something that he, has been think he had been thinking about a lot. So you have to consider that it's something that he really wanted. Mm -hmm. It's not something that marketers like sprung upon him. And then he explained the rationale for having the television. He said, look, it's just not that much to do. There's not that much work. Uh, it's a very dry area, so it's not very productive. We have to, you know, we get bored. Like we have to have uh, something to do, and the television is also sort of a center of socialization for people who come to his house and watch television. So it just made him. It is what made him happy and what made la life worth mm -hmm. living. Mm -hmm. So it is only by saying, "Oh, but you could eat more if you didn't have the television," but like. What's the point? I, I don't live to eat, right? <laughs> I eat to live, and, and this life has to be worth it. Mm -hmm. So I think this is a good example of the, the mistakes we are making when we are following our own intuitions, which are coming from a completely different perspective, and why it's so important to just spend time and interrogating the mm -hmm. field. Da gibt es ja auch viele Missverständnisse und viele Vorurteile, die man hat. Und jetzt gerade das Beispiel mit dem Fernseher, glaube ich, ist so gut und so sprechend, weil ich doch denken würde, es gibt viele Leute, die sagen würden, naja, dass Kinder verhungern, das wollen wir nicht. Wir wollen auch nicht, dass Kinder sterben, weil sie an Malaria erkranken beispielsweise. Aber wenn Leute sich Fernsehgeräte leisten können, dann sind sie nicht wirklich arm. Deswegen müssen wir wahrscheinlich auch darüber sprechen, was heißt denn wirklich arm? Was ist die Definition? die Sie in Ihrer Arbeit zugrunde legen? I mean, these people were clearly unhappy about the amount they had to eat. You ask them, it's not that they were saying that we have plenty to eat and then we buy about the television. They're saying we face a trade-off which between adequately feeding our family and having a life that's bearable. I think, I think the I think to me, the poor are people who face these extremely arduous choices, these choices that are not defensible in some sense. I don't want to, anybody in the world to face a choice between having a bearable life and having food for the children. That's a, to, to me, that's poverty. When you fa face extreme choices, that's poverty. Und diese extremen ähm, Entscheidungen, die man treffen muss, haben Sie jetzt gesagt, betreffen Nahrung, betrifft das auch Bildung? Also wenn jemand, zum Beispiel ein Vater, sich entscheiden muss, kaufe ich Fernsehgerät oder schicke ich meine Kinder zur Schule? Right, for example, or if I have to, a lot of families actually have to decide which child to continue in school, mm -hmm. because, you know, not, they can't afford all of them. And they actually make decisions uh, about, you know, I'm going to pick this one child and I'm going to put my money on this child and, you know, I have to get some maybe help for this child from outside because I personally can't help the child with homework. So I have to get somebody else, pay somebody else to do that. Mm -hmm. Can I do that for all the children or can I do it just for one? And a lot of families face those kinds of extremely harsh choices, which is, you know, I have to tell my other children and you see it all the time. You know, You know, you know, these children, they're not going to make it. Mm -hmm. you, 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 you know, your sister or brother, or more, maybe more often, is going to be the one who makes, yeah. makes it. You, it's, yeah. that's the end of the road. Bleiben wir noch kurz bei diesen Bildern der Armut, weil mich das auch sehr interessiert. Sie persönlich kommen ja aus sehr unterschiedlichen Umfeldern und Sie erzählen auch in diesem Buch, dass die Bilder, die Sie als Kinder von Armut hatten, sehr unterschiedlich waren und dass sie auch diese Bilder revidieren mussten. Sie, Frau Duflo, sind in Frankreich geboren. Ihr Vater war Mathematiker, die Mutter Ärztin. Sie kamen aus einem relativ wohlhabenden Umfeld und hatten so die Vorstellung arm, das ist so Mutter Teresa und die Umgebung, Kinder, die verhungern. Währenddessen Sie, Herr Banerjee, sind in Kalkutta aufgewachsen, in einer wohlhabenden Familie, aber sehr, sehr nahe am Slum dran. Und Sie haben als Kind primär das Bild gehabt, die Kinder, die im Slum leben, haben mehr Freizeit. Die gewinnen immer beim Murmelspiel, die können viel mehr draußen spielen, währenddessen Sie die Schulbank drücken mussten. Wie sind Sie weiter mit diesen Bildern verfahren? Was mussten Sie so richtig über Bord werfen und wo dann denken Sie, eigentlich hatte ich als Kind doch auch etwas schon früh begriffen? 
I think uh, what I had to, to do uh, is to kind of throw, <laughs> really throw overboard, the expression you use is exactly the right one, is throw overboard all those cliché. In a sense, I think those cliché are, are, were part, maybe more true when I grew up in, uh, in the 80s when I became you know, aware of the world around me than they are today. And they also are somewhat exaggerated by the distance and by some amount of maybe marketing to some extent for people like me to become interested in the story of the poor. But I had in mind um, basically the fact that poor people have no choices. We talked about them having stark choices. I thought that the life, in a sense, uh, to, to, to boil it to a nutshell, that the life of a poor person was a life of constraint, like the life of a machine trying to maximize their ability to survive and that's it. And that was completely missing the fact that uh, there is actually much more scope and much more space for poor people in the world having very, very rich lives and wanting to have even richer lives. And uh, often it doesn't take that much, and that's kind of a lot of our work is trying to get that. It doesn't take that, that much a small changes to make that even richer and to open even more possibilities. Mm -hmm. So that the income poverty doesn't become a poverty of your actual life. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, for me, for me, what was often sort of puzzling was that you know there was this whole. I mean, tra being trained as an economist, you hear these sort of this. You know, the, there's a market, and you know there's a labor market, and then there are pe people get a wage, and that wage is whatever what the market would bear, and you know, and then you see a sort of this sense of you know many people just feeling, you know they can't deal with the world. I mean, I grew up among many people I used to play with, grew up to be uh, teenagers who didn't really know their way in the world. And they were often, their families often relied on them, but it wasn't that they could take that responsibility. And you keep feeling that, well, is why aren't these people, you know, you're, if you're trained to say, look, you know, you're supposed to go to the labor market and earn a wage now that you, you have dropped out of school. But it's sort of, in some ways, it misses entirely the story of why were they, uh, why was I uh, able to go through the school system and why, why did they drop out of school? It sort of starts, in some ways, the perspective we had was often one that made us not ask the right questions. And, you know, and I think that's, that sort of bo bothered me for a long time. I was not really trained as an economist to study the poor. I was trained as a you know, very mainstream economist. And, but then you feel that you don't actually understand so many things you have seen in your life. Und diese, diese, diese Einsicht zieht sich ja wie ein roter Faden durch Ihre Arbeit und auch durch dieses Buch. Eben, ich habe es schon erwähnt, Poor Economics, ein sehr erfolgreiches Buch. 2011 war es das Wirtschaftsbuch des Jahres, der Financial Times, in vielen, vielen Sprachen erschienen und eine Art Standardwerk, wenn man sich für diese randomisierten Studien interessiert. Und was mich, ich würde da gerne noch ein bisschen weiter bohren, diese randomisierten Studien, die wir am Anfang jetzt gesehen haben. Was man ja spürt, ist, dass sie wirklich sagen, wir müssen herausfinden, was wollen die Leute wirklich. Und wir müssen auch herausfinden, wie kriegen wir sie dazu, das, was wir anbieten können, so zu präsentieren, dass sie es auch nutzen wollen. Jetzt gibt es natürlich äh, Vorwürfe. Leute sagen, na ja, aber das ist so ein bisschen wie Versuchskaninchen. Sie äh, machen da eine Studie, die einen kriegen irgendwie dieses Setting, die anderen dieses und dieses, dieses. Und sie schauen nachher als Ökonomen, wie haben, wir das, wie haben die sich verhalten. Und das ist so, als wären die in einem Labor, die werden nicht wirklich gefragt, die werden nicht aufgeklärt. Das geht eigentlich nicht, die Menschen so zu behandeln. Reagieren Sie darauf? So I think there are two, uh, two, two reactions that are worth uh, having to that. The first one is that we study the poor because we are interested in the poor. So it's very different than you know, the criticism that sometimes are uh, leveraged to pharmaceutical labs that they study the poor to develop a medicine against Alzheimer's, say, that is then in fact going to be used in rich countries. So one could in fact object to that because the burden of research should be commensurate to the benefits. And it is not okay to study something somewhere and use it elsewhere. But if you want to understand the poor, 
you have to study the poor. <laughs> and if you want to understand the poor in poor countries, that's where you have to work. So the idea that the poor are guinea pigs from this point of view makes no sense at all. Mm -hmm. Like if we were working on the rich, we would be using the rich as guinea pigs. The second point is the, 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 the reason why people talk about guinea pigs is they talk about, they, they think about the experimental setup and people get upset about the randomization, for example, that you do something in some villages and something in some other villages. And that's totally missing the, the point of how programs and policies are allocated anywhere in the real world. In the real world, it is not the case that the government is saying, starting tomorrow, I'm going to implement this policy everywhere. And that we come and say, no, 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 you have to deprive these few people from this policy so that we can test it. In the real world, you always start somewhere. So either you start in that village because it's nearby, or you start in that village because it's a cousin of the wife of your best friend. That's no better, you know, it's just like in some level we have been working now in this business of conducting randomized control trials. We always get assent, consent from the communities where we work. And they, we never really had any objection against randomization because they think that's like at least it is fair and it is transparent. Also wissen auch die Dörfer, dass sie Teil sind einer solchen Studie? Yes, most of the time. There are cases where the experiments are very, very large and the data, we never really collect any data in which case, because we use just administrative data, in which case they might not know. Mm -hmm. But in any cases where we collect data, which is most cases, yes, people are informed of what we are doing and uh, they also, if the program works, if the program is shown to be work out, then it is often scaled up, at least in that area. Mm -hmm. So. The randomization also and the experiment, because it shows effects to be large when they are large, has also allowed for more funds to be get targeted toward these communities than otherwise. Mm -hmm. So when you do a pilot for 50 villages and you never know whether it works or not, then you might move, go on with it or not. But if you show a great success, then that gives you leverage to do mm -hmm. more. Mm -hmm. So. Sie sind ja sehr erfolgreich mit dem, was Sie tun. Sie haben beide schon ganz viele Preise gewonnen, haben Professuren, Gastprofessuren, zwei bekannte Leute. Man sagt manchmal, Sie werden bald einmal noch Nobelpreisträgerin. Also zwei hochdekorierte Wissenschaftler. Und gleichzeitig, wenn man dieses Buch liest, merkt man, Sie machen die kleinen Schritte. Und Sie sagen auch, hört auf, über Patentrezepte zu sprechen. Das kommt ja immer so in Wellen. Irgendwann heißt es, alle Leute brauchen Mikrokredite. Alle Leute brauchen Bildung. Alle Leute brauchen Moskitonetze, aber es ist immer so das Ganze, das Patentrezept. Da sagen sie, Hände weg. Ist es nicht ein bisschen enttäuschend, von der Ökonomie her gedacht, hätte man doch gerne das Patentrezept? Oh, I would love to have a panacea. If I, I could believe in it, it would be great. <lacht> uh, I, I just, I guess at this point I haven't yet seen one that I believe in. And I've sort of got to the point where I tend to believe that We are, we are we're really trying to solve many problems. That's the part of the problem with the panacea is, you know, when microcredit was going to solve AIDS, that, that, that just seemed <laughs> <laughs> implausible to me. And, it's in, it, and it probably was implausible. Uh, and I think the general problem is, is, is sort of, you know, you are, you really, the problem of poverty, I think is often it's like, you know, you think of it as being one monolithic problem. But in fact, it's many, many problems. And some poor people have one problem, and some poor people have a very different problem. And they're not, they're not really, you know, there's some people who are very entrepreneurial, but don't have the opportunities. And others are not at all entrepreneurial, but and need a different kind of help. And you, if you think that one of these things is going to help all of them, I think you are just naive about the nature of poverty. This poverty is not a sort of a, a monolithic condition that descends on you. It's not a, you know, you have a gene which is called poverty. It's an it's a, it's a accretion of many different things which we together, we have a similar outcomes as so we call them all poor. Now think, of, think of rich countries. Mm -hmm. Like you didn't, you wouldn't ask us, is there a panacea for rich countries? <laughs> like it would, it is, it's, it's not even, it doesn't even like pass the sentence. No, it, like because in rich countries we understand that there are very many problems. So I think it's just because looking from here, if you're looking for a panacea, it's because looking from here you're lacking the perspective that when you become closer, it is just like here, there is any number of issues. 
and these any number of issues need to be looked one by one. But the silver lining is that if you're not looking for a panacea, you don't become discouraged that, oh my God, the problem is too big and I'm never going to succeed. Once you get closer and closer and closer and you realize that actually it's a myriad of different issues, you can put your mind and you can put your energy on mm -hmm. one thing at a time. And there, although we don't have panacea, we've, we've, we've studied some things that have really large effects yeah. on people's lives. Ich habe hier zwei Ökonomen am Tisch und ich muss diese Frage stellen. Im Moment gibt es, gibt es einfach sehr viele ähm, Publikationen, die erscheinen, die sagen, naja, was wir doch sehen, groß gedacht, systemisch gedacht, der Kapitalismus hat zu Auswüchsen geführt, die wir so nicht mehr haben wollen. Und wir sehen das eben gerade auch an diesen unglaublich Ungleichverteilungen von, von Einkommen. Wir sehen das aber auch eben an dieser unendlichen Armut in Ländern, die eigentlich reich wären. Also der sogenannte Ressourcenfluch beispielsweise, dass Länder mit unglaublich vielen Rohstoffen nicht aus der Armutsspirale herauskommen. Und da gibt es ja viele, die die Systemfrage stellen und sagen, müssten wir nicht ein ganz anderes Weltwirtschaftssystem zum Beispiel haben. Würden Sie da einfach sagen, nein, vielen Dank, Patentrezept gibt es nicht, oder würden Sie sagen, Mag schon sein, aber das ist nicht unser Gebiet? Neither. I, I would say that there's, I mean, the general message that lots of policy gets done without any evidentiary basis, I think a very good example of that is the extreme willingness to cut taxes on the rich uh, and cut redistribution as a result of that, that the Western countries have adopted since the time of uh, Reagan and Thatcher. I mean, this, this idea that somehow redistribution is too costly, it destroys growth, I don't think there's much evidence for that at all. I think it was just some myth that was made up and was propagated very powerfully through partly through some work in economics, partly through political processes, but I don't think that if you looked on the, on the data that actually looks at what is the effect of increasing taxes on, do the, as soon as you increase taxes, does everybody go to sleep? You don't see any evidence of that. It's not that the rich people really need to have zero taxes on them to make, most mm -hmm. rich people are extremely ambitious. They want to make money, even if the taxes are high, they make money. I don't, just, I don't see, I think this, there's an entire set of beliefs about how incentives are like, we have to have lots of incentives, otherwise nothing's, everything's going to go to pot. There's no evidence for it. It's, to me, it's the classic example of a, a set of very powerful myths that are essentially unconnected to data. Mm -hmm. I think at the, the sort of the, the macro level, the economic system level, maybe, um, at least I don't feel that I have a good understanding of it. It's possible that uh, not very many people have a good understanding of it. But suppose that we take as given the idea that if the economic, economic growth in the world slows down, particularly in rich countries slows down, and demographic growth also slows down, then there is a pretty natural uh, tendency for inequality to go up. Then the question becomes, okay, w is there something that can be done against it. Mm -hmm. And to me, it's going to be a lot about economic policies and therefore about redistribution policies. So some of the questions that Abhijit talks about, which is, okay, some of the redistribution involve redistribution at the top, mm -hmm. which is what are you doing with taxes? Mm -hmm. So it would be great to do randomized control trial on taxes. <laughs> and I think yeah. when, when you see people are not stopping to work, but I don't know, we, have to, we would have to do that. Yeah. And then on the other end, and this is where our work is located, is that once you have the money, how do you effectively use it to make sure that the people who are left behind from the sort of natural train mm -hmm. uh, can get put back on that train? Mm -hmm. And uh, what is it that people need uh, in terms of uh, education, in terms of training, in terms of uh, um, ways to spend their mm -hmm. lives, redistribution? Mm -hmm both in rich countries and in poor countries. So it turns out our work is more located mm -hmm. in poor countries, but the approach to it in the end fundamentally is not very different. Mm -hmm. Is that if you are fighting against the system, unless you're going to do the revolution tomorrow, then you have to understand what type of economic reforms are going to make that system bearable for everybody and, and just for everybody. And that setzt ja eine zweite Kritik an. Also wir hatten schon über die Kritik gesprochen mit den Versuchskaninchen. Eine andere Kritik, die sehr generell gegen jegliche Form von Entwicklungshilfe schießt, die sagt, 
Entwicklungshilfe macht diese Staaten nur abhängig. Und eigentlich ist es entweder nutzlos oder sogar schädlich, weil Entwicklungshilfe äh, ist ein Problem für diese Staaten. Es gibt zum Beispiel Damisa Moyo, eine berühmte ähm, äh, Ökonomin, die das sagt, aber auch äh, William Easterly, äh, eigentlich ein Kollege von ihm, kann man fast schon sagen, wir retten die Welt zu Tode, ein prominenter äh, Kritiker von Entwicklungshilfe. Was sagen Sie dazu? In, uh, I guess Clearly, they, they point to some specific examples where the aid was not very useful. And I would say that if I, if I had to think about what the history of aid, I think it's perfectly fair to say that a bunch of it was political. I mean, the reason why Israel is, happens to be the, um, the U.S.'s biggest aid recipient presumably is not to do with the fact that there's great poverty in Israel. So I, I do think that that's, that is perfectly reasonable to say. If you, and, but that's what makes it very hard to know whether aid is useful or not, because there's a bunch of aid that was given for political reasons and was explicitly given for, I mean, targeted for political reasons. It's not that there was any secret there. You have to kind of strip that out from the rest of the aid, uh, partly, and it's not trivial to do. But I think more importantly, I think the vision we see where I think aid has been The examples we like, best examples, are, for example, the development of um, high-yielding varieties of rice and wheat. This has saved millions of lives. It has made many, millions of people's lives bearable. This was entirely an international effort, aid funded through the CIFIR. Uh, mm -hmm. And it was, it was a, it's a great success. If you think about why we say that now there is extreme, less extreme poverty, one of the key key contributors to that was the development of these new technologies. Mm -hmm. da, dass Sie erwähnen, dass, dass wir tatsächlich ja weniger Armut haben, also die Armut sinkt eigentlich rapide, das weiß man manchmal gar nicht so recht und man diskutiert zu wenig darüber. Ich habe eine Grafik mitgebracht, da sehen wir, wie die extreme Armut eigentlich unglaublich stark abnimmt. Man kann eigentlich fast schon sagen, eine riesige Erfolgsgeschichte. Die Anzahl Menschen, die nicht in extremer Armut leben, sehen wir in Pinkfarben und im dunkleren Violett sehen wir die Menschen, die eben äh, in extremer Armut leben. Und wir sehen, wie das seit 1820 ein bisschen zugenommen und danach rapide abgenommen, währenddessen logischerweise, weil natürlich auch die Bevölkerungszahlen so steigen, äh, sehen wir äh, einen unglaublichen Anstieg jetzt von Menschen, die eben aus der extremen Armut auch herausgefunden haben. Aber was ich eigentlich auf den Punkt, auf den ich ähm, hinaus wollte, ist, dass neuere Hochrechnungen beispielsweise von der FAO oder von der ähm, WHO, sagen oder rechnen damit, dass im Jahr 2050 sehr viel mehr Menschen, fast 20 Prozent mehr Menschen in Armut leben werden. Und das hat zu tun mit der Klimakatastrophe. Also man rechnet damit, dass der Klimawandel unglaubliche Steigerung der extremen Armut, äh, Steigerungszahlen verursachen wird. Was sagen Sie dazu und verändert der Klimawandel eigentlich Ihre Arbeit? So there are many, uh, many interesting things in what you're saying. So first of all, the decline of extreme poverty. Um, I think one shouldn't credit aid <laughs> completely for that. Most of the extreme, in, the decline in, in, in extreme poverty is in China and India, which are not, and in recent years, which are not big recipient of aid. Uh, there is, uh, um, so uh, we shouldn't, Put the es ist ein, ein guter as a, Punkt. Zum Teil ist das auch for, einfach sozusagen and, and das Wirtschaftswachstum, that, oder? Das von sich exactly, aus sozusagen. Uh, so, well, it's economic growth and economic success. And, mm. so, and that relates to the, to the question you were asking before. One could have a discussion on aid, and uh, there are good things and bad things, but I don't see this, this I see this discussion, this um, criticism almost are orthogonal to criticism of our work. We're not primarily interested in aid. In fact, we are not interested in aid, really. We are interested in aid to the extent it can help, but mm -hmm. we are interested in social policy, whoever pays for it. And the reality is the vast majority of the money that is being spent for the poor in the form of social programs, redistribution or whatever, comes from the developing countries themselves. And that is true even in Africa, and that is true even in poor countries. In Auch Af in den allerärmsten Ländern, also beispielsweise in Malawi, Niger, Malawi, Malawi is a very small country, so maybe the share of uh, aid in Malawi is larger. But on Africa as a whole, the last number I, I had seen is that 13% of the budget from African country comes from aid. 
So that means 87% is their own money. Ja, is and we're interested. Glass, <laughs> glass. Yeah. And we're interested in this hundred, which is, you know, how do we how do we spend that money wherever it comes from better? And in As a sense, aid can play a role in spending the entire pot better, because aid is more flexible and aid is uh, can first of all respond to catastrophes better than governments can, because it's international, so they can rush with money. So that's going to be, I think potentially with climate, make a big difference in the future. And number two, aid can uh, see both the global perspective and the long run more than countries which have like immediate deadlines and therefore they can invest in research. And so the example of the development of the high yielding variety is very, is very, um, is very important. Mm -hmm. So that was point number one. If you want to talk about climate, or the uh, rest of the... I mean, I think that the Climate is, a, I think, a catastrophe that will hit us. How badly it'll hit us, we don't know. I, I think it will, I have, I have no reason to s say that the WH is wrong, but it is, it's certainly not the case that uh, the, these estimates are based on great deal of very reliable science. So I think, I think the fact that temperatures will go up, I totally believe how much that will change the cropping mix of countries and therefore the productivity and therefore po poverty and in particular how that will interact with other global trends is it, it seems to me to be so complicated that you know making very l precise predictions about you know 20% or 17% or you know could it could be it could keep going down my view given what we know it still could be that poverty keeps going down. It could be, for, I mean, for example, just because there, there are, it's still true that the poor countries are growing, thankfully. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, or it could blow up uh, totally. There could be wars. I mean, they, they, I think we're, I mean, it's a disaster. Climate change is a disaster. But it's a disaster with such, in, the, it opens up a set of possibilities, including extreme ones, which are like you know, civil wars, wars, water wars. I mean, just I have just no mm. idea whether 20 percent, it could be 50 percent, mm. for all I know. Was sagen Sie denn im Moment zu Somalia? In Somalia heißt es ja, ähm, die, also die Vereinten Nationen sprechen von der größten humanitären Krise seit dem Zweiten Weltkrieg. Sechs Millionen Menschen brauchen ganz dringend Nahrungsmittel. Und wenn man die Lage analysiert, hat das natürlich politische Ursachen einerseits, mit den ganzen verschiedenen terroristischen Milizen, die da irgendwie wüten. Aber es gibt auch eine anhaltende Dürre, die unglaubliche Ernteausfälle und vor allem auch äh, das Vieh, das stirbt. Und da gibt es ja schon die Frage, hat das was zu tun mit dem Klimawandel? Was sagen, würden Sie jetzt da auch sagen, da müssen wir mit unseren Studien irgendwie etwas testen oder braucht das andere Formen von Analysen? Uh, so, on, I think one thing that is really worth pointing out on climate is that that's really, here there is uh, such a clear responsibility from the rich country that has nothing to do with whether you feel good about the poor or not. Most of the climate change is caused by what's happening in rich countries and in China, which is also becoming rich countries. Most of the most tragic consequences are happening in poor countries because the rich countries are better insulated from most of that, both because of their geographic location and because they already, you know, they already have the air conditioning that that makes it bearable to live in the hot and heat. And so I think the here is a place where uh, the the rich world bears a, an enormous responsibility towards uh, towards helping out uh, in the the consequence of climate as well as m mitigating the, the climate moving forward. In terms of what to do and whether that brings up the need for new studies, I'm not very sure because uh, you need to know, okay, we all agree, we A, need to fight climate change on the one hand, and B, we need to find ways to uh, mitigate the consequences on the poor on the other hand. Both of these questions are questions that are the exact type of problems that can be addressed very well with randomized controlled trials. In fact, we have lots of studies in the Poverty Action Lab networks on both of these things. Mm -hmm. Das ist Ihr Forschungszentrum, 
in dem ungefähr 100 yes. Wissenschaftler oder sogar mehr in Boston am MIT zusammenarbeiten und eben diese verschiedenen Arten von Studien miteinander verweben und sie sind in dauerndem Austausch. Ein riesiges Institut, J-Paul heißt dieses äh, Institut, genau. Vielleicht würde ich gerne, bevor ich weitergehe, doch noch einmal von Ihnen genauer wissen, was sagen Sie zu Somalia? Ich habe jetzt noch nicht gehört, wie analysieren Sie die Lage? Well, I, I think partly Somalia has, I, sus I suspect when people, the drought is, you know, there have been long droughts in Somalia before. I, I, I will, I, I'm pretty pro convinced that climate change is really having effects. So I, I would say most, but I think the big problem in Somalia is that at some level Somalia was allowed to become a, a political, sort of was totally margin, allowed to marginalize itself in a way that places which have oil never get to have that chance. And you know, we, there is a certain, certain, it's not accidental that, you know, when bad things happen in Iraq and Syria, uh, somehow the whole world intervenes, but Somalia is allowed to be, I mean, this was a known process. This is a process that has been going on for 15 years now. And it's just getting worse and worse and worse, and nobody is prepared to pay the cost of intervening. It, you know, I think especially, uh, you know, after after the experience of, uh, I guess, the Clinton, uh, Clinton administration, mm -hmm. nobody else has decided. They've basically since then the U.S. got burnt once. They decided mm -hmm. no way we're going to trust these people, and you know, this is a situation like in Iraq and Syria where some outside intervention is actually necessary. And dafür würden Sie plädieren. Oh yeah, I, I, for me, so, Somalians are people and they, we're just, somehow we're willing to turn, turn a blind out and die to their absolute, the disastrous political equilibrium they've fallen into. This was, this happened over time. We allowed it to happen. Mm -hmm. It's not that, you know, if 20 years ago we could have intervened and stopped it with very little cost. Mm -hmm. Now it's going to be costlier. Da sind wir ja eigentlich beim Punkt, dass ganz viel Armut eben auch politische Ursachen hat. Und auch das ist ein Einwand manchmal gegen Entwicklungshilfe, obwohl man ja sofort sieht, die beiden Dinge müssen sich ja nicht ausschließen. Man kann Hilfe leisten und auf der anderen Seite politische Systeme beeinflussen oder versuchen, das ganze Design auch des Welthandels beispielsweise anzupassen. Aber dennoch vielleicht äh, auf diesen Punkt möchte ich auch mit Ihnen zu sprechen äh, kommen. Es gibt einen weiteren Ökonomen, der auch ein Kollege ist von Ihnen, Angus Dieten, Professor in Princeton, und er kritisiert, dass eigentlich die Ungleichverteilung der Verhandlungsmacht zwischen den verschiedenen Ländern eines der ganz großen Probleme sei. Hören wir ihm kurz zu. Wir müssen umdenken. Wir sollten aufhören, Hilfe in einem Land zu leisten, und stattdessen müssen wir Hilfe für ein Land leisten. Denken Sie an Handelsverträge, die Drittweltstaaten mit den USA abschließen. Nehmen wir ein Land wie Honduras. Sobald die Verhandlungen losgehen, werden die US-Pharmaunternehmen ihre Juristen losschicken. Die Jungs bekommen Millionen, um die Verträge auszuhandeln. Was kann Honduras dem entgegenhalten? Vielleicht haben sie ein paar gute Leute, aber sie spielen nicht in der gleichen Liga. Da könnten wir eingreifen und ihnen Experten zur Seite stellen, die ihnen helfen, Handelsverträge mit den USA oder anderen reichen Ländern auszuhandeln. I often disagree with him, but on this one I completely agree. I, I, mean, I think this is sort of how we think of aid in our in our world where aid, I think, can be incredibly useful, is by providing know-how to developing countries. It's not the case. I mean, it's one of the things that's sort of why we exist. Poverty Action Lab exists because we want to be useful to, when somebody actually wants to solve a problem, can they, is it that, you know, ev everything is equally good or bad, or can we tell them something that's useful? So in some sense, the f aid could be very powerful precisely by creating an enabling environment where countries will eventually have to do their own choices. I, I agree with Angus. But I do, don't think that those choices are necessarily the right choices unless we provide the, the knowledge. And I think one of the things we, we are hoping to do in our work is to create a, a, a kind of a, a template of knowledge where you, if you wanted to solve a problem, here is a, this is what's known, This is what may, is, may not be known, but we could try to study, study it in your country, and this way we could try to actually solve problems. I think a huge amount of money is wasted 
both aid money and not aid, non-aid money, country money is wasted because of they are thrown at the wrong things, and you know right. they're like millions and billions of dollars are wasted when they because they are thrown at the wrong things. Mm -hmm. And I, I do think that there, that's one of the places. Where I totally agree with him uh, on the view that mm -hmm. we can do things for countries. Mm -hmm. Sie sind auch einverstanden. <lacht> Vielleicht, Sie arbeiten zusammen, sind jetzt auch einverstanden in diesem Punkt. Sie sind auch privat ein Paar. Das heißt, Sie haben eine große gemeinsame Welt, Ihre Forschungswelt, Ihre private Welt. Sie haben zwei kleine Kinder. Wie organisieren Sie eigentlich Ihren Alltag? Sie müssen ja unglaublich viel unterwegs sein. Also wenn man dieses Buch hier liest, denkt man, Sie sind eigentlich die ganze Zeit irgendwo in armen Ländern. Wie organisieren Sie das alles? Hm. So, for example, uh, we are going to go to India uh, in a couple of weeks now, and we are just taking the kids along with us. So we are going for long enough that they can just be there, and so that allows us to do our work and the kids to be with us. Mit der Sache mit auf. <laughs> yeah, they yes. go with the subject matters. I hope. Uh, I hope. It's. I hope we manage to bring them up to be sensitized to the, all these things and you know I think that's if we fail to do that we are failing in our role as parents. We grew both of us in our respective families grew up with those subject matters yes. as well and uh, my mom was involved in, um, in NGOs helping kids in uh, war-torn countries because my mother was uh, ran an NGO helping women who were being battered by the husbands and so I mean we, all this this is sort of this the social kind of thinking was we got, had it from the get go I mean mm -hmm. and I think that's a great gift we got from Sie bedanken sich ja auch bei ihren Müttern äh, in diesem Buch und sagen auch dass sie diesen beiden Frauen sozusagen ihre ihren Willen ihre Energie verdanken äh, etwas selber zu ändern sprechen wir noch ein bisschen über über sie und mich und über unsere Zuschauer und Zuschauerinnen wir alle sind ja eigentlich global gesehen unfassbar reich. Jetzt, Sie haben am Anfang mal gesagt, es gibt Unterschiede in der Art und Weise, wie man auf die Frage der Hilfe gucken kann. Man kann darüber diskutieren, ob wir verpflichtet sind zu helfen. Das ist das eine. Und dann gibt es sowas wie den Klimawandel. Da ist völlig klar, wir sind schuld daran oder mitschuldig. Und da gibt es überhaupt keine Frage. Da müssen wir einfach dafür sorgen, dass das die Effekte davon irgendwie aufgefangen werden können für diejenigen, die gar nicht dazu beigetragen haben. Aber wenn wir jetzt mal nur über das Helfen sprechen, was würden Sie sagen, ist meine Verantwortung als eine Person, die vergleichsweise global gesehen unfassbar reich ist? So, I think everybody has to uh, resolve this question for themselves, but uh, for uh, me, for example, or for us, the family, the way we think about it is a, you know, understanding that happens to be our job, so that's helpful. But I think everybody can try and spend some time to understand a, 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 a thing. Like a, one of the one of the questions that they are particularly interested in, get familiar with it and get uh, and read about it and. Uh, Uh, and learn more about it. I think that's responsibility number one, I would say, is getting some understanding and fami fam and of... And how does man das? Zeitung lesen or...? Read, uh, maybe often go, maybe further than the newspaper, get uh, uh, um, on the topic that you're interested, follow, um, read websites, try to get documents that are coming from, from the developing countries themselves, etc. Follow thread. There is actually a lot of information out there. Uh, not to advertise ourselves, but our own website is a good place to start where mm -hmm. it has topics on various, uh, you know, it has good uh, documents on various topics and it also gives you a, a place to start to read more about it and get familiar with the, with the work that is being done in developing countries. So I think that's possible now and uh, one place to start is our website and there are other good websites to start that we could share with, with your audience. The other thing with that is, uh, as far as um, for, for us, is also actually giving money. It's uh, it sounds <laughs> it sounds pedestrian, but I think when I use, as you say, we are so rich. I think giving a part of it is uh, is a responsibility. And uh, if you spend time understanding, you also have more chances to do it smartly mm -hmm. and do it in a way where you know it's making a difference. 
So for example, give money to organizations that are doing work that has been proven to be effective. Mm -hmm. so es gibt ja auch die Bewegung des effektiven Altruismus und die betonen auch immer wieder, dass man Hilfswerke ähm, berücksichtigen yeah. sollte in erster Linie, die eben mit den entsprechenden Testmethoden, die sie auch yeah. anwenden, zeigen können, dass die Hilfe wirklich effektiv ist, also auch wirklich hilft. Yeah. Und da kommt man ja so ein bisschen in ein Dilemma rein, weil manchmal denkt man dann, naja, das sind so Riesenorganisationen, wenn ich da 100 Franken spende, dann ist das so ein Mini-Tröpfchen. Wenn ich ein kleines Hilfswerk berücksichtige, dann macht das für die echt einen Unterschied. Und man hat irgendwie den Eindruck, da möchte ich gerne, da kenne ich die Leute persönlich, ich möchte gerne das kleine Hilfswerk wählen. Aber das ist vielleicht weniger effektiv. Können Sie dieses Dilemma auch verstehen? I would say that the sort of the individual donor sitting in Switzerland and having a day job, so not having too much time to, uh, to identify someone in particular, it might, it might be difficult for them to go and identify like this one place that is really doing something great with a talented person. It might be possible, but it might be difficult. So the work that we do uh, on our website that uh, effective altruism does, that give well does, that giving what we can does, is to try and sort of go and identify uh, organizations who are doing programs that have been shown to be effective and who are doing it well. Not all of these organizations are, uh, are large, actually. Mm -hmm. uh, some of these organizations are quite small. Uh, many are local, because actually it's the local organizations that are doing the best work with the less, least overhead. So these, they tend to be picked by those, uh, by those people. And so if you have a limited amount of, of, of time, Mm -hmm. and a limited amount of money, naturally, then it sort of makes sense to start with that. Mm -hmm. And within that, there is a choice. One could go for the smallest of these organizations, and yet you would be reasonably confident mm -hmm. that they are, they are doing good work. And then getting as familiar as you can with their work, you know, will lead you from one thing to the other with maybe finding someone else who is trying to emulate the same thing from mm -hmm. a different place or whatever. Und glauben Sie, wenn alle Menschen das tun würden und wir weiterhin spenden, aber mehr spenden und besser werden, wird die extreme Armut irgendwann aussterben? It should be. I mean, there's no, no excuse for it not to be eradicated. I think the world has enough resources. It's really a tiny amount of money that will pull everybody pretty much. I mean, there are places like Somalia where we don't know what to do about it. But I think most places in the world, most poor people in the world live in states which do a lot. And um, I think there is no reason to think that if with some more resources we couldn't just solve the also problem. Also, Sie glauben, das Problem ist lösbar. Man kann Armut beseitigen, extreme Armut beseitigen. Absolutely. At least as we define poverty today. Yes. Mm -hmm. I mean, one hope in a sense is that once the current number of people living under a dollar ninety a day, which is the current threshold for extreme poverty, goes to zero, then we change the threshold and we said it's really not acceptable to live with less than two and a half dollars a day or three dollars mm -hmm. a day. So I think there will always be a poorest person in the world and a poorest person in society, and we should always be concerned about that person. So in a sense, the problem of poverty will be with us because there will always be a poorest person. Mm -hmm. But I think it is possible that these poorest people live considerably better. Mm -hmm. And it is not just, we are not just talking about fiction. It really is the case that over the last 30 years or so, many indicators have improved in the world. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we talked about extreme poverty, but the number of kids who live under the, who die under the age of five has been divided by two since 1990. The number of people who die of HIV has been divided by two since about 2003. The number of kids who go to school, boys and girls, is getting, you know, to primary school is almost everybody now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there has been progress, and there is still much progress to be done, but it is a story which, on balance, has a lot of bright spots, and I think we should learn from these successes, learn from the failures, and try and expand the successes, both with more resources and with a better use of those resources. Vielleicht zum Schluss noch, wir haben gesehen, die Probleme sind natürlich komplex, aber sie hängen auch miteinander zusammen. Also Armut ist ein Thema, Ungleichheit ist ein Thema, Weltwirtschaft ist ein Thema, Klima ist ein Thema. Ein Thema, das ebenso brennt, ist die Migration. Und manchmal ist ja auch die Frage, inwiefern sollten wir die Migration erst recht 
zulassen oder sogar noch befördern, weil die sogenannten Remittances, also die Gelder, die die Menschen, die migrieren, nach Hause schicken, ja einen unglaublich hohen Anteil ausmachen des Geldes, das sozusagen den Ärmsten dann zugutekommt. Je nach Berechnungen sagt man, ist ein Drittel des gesamten Entwicklungsbudgets kommt von solchen sogenannten Remittances. Wie stehen Sie dazu? Vielleicht noch zum Schluss, wenn wir ins Thema der Migration blicken. Ist das für Sie ein relevanter Entwicklungsaspekt und einen, wo Sie sagen würden, ja, mach die Grenzen auf? In particular, I think the thing that you didn't say, which is also important, is that there is pretty much no evidence that uh, these people hurt the countries they're going to. In fact, all the evidence suggests that they're also good for the countries they go to, because many of these countries are aging, they are they are they don't have young people, they need young people. So I, I don't think there is I mean just reading the evidence carefully, I think this seems win-win pretty much across the board. I think other than the fact that there are there's a certain amount of paranoia in the world about, you know, different looking people who are going to come into my neighborhood, which I see as being something that we have to negotiate. It's real, it's people feel it that feel that way. But I, I do think that the economics of it is kind of blindingly simple. I think most people, at least right now, a large movement of population will be both, both good for rich countries and poor countries. Mm -hmm. British countries, many of them, like Switzerland, need young people. And it's a Another thing that is worth saying is that should we open the border more widely? Actually, we bet that we wouldn't see that many, we wouldn't see like huge flux of people suddenly overrunning us. There are many reasons why people like to stay where they are. And so some more people would come, but not to an extent that it would change the social fabric uh, in a radical way. Even for example, where we see within countries, where people of course can go from one place to another as they wish, If anything, one would want more people to move to the cities where they would earn much more money that mm -hmm. they could send back home in the form of remittances. So there is a lot of things that pull people back. Um, so I don't think we should be worried that opening the frontiers more widely would lead to a suddenly mass uh, flux of people. What it would do is avoid situations that are absolutely disgraceful, such that, uh, you know, camp of people living in the, uh, absolutely terrible conditions in a country like France. Mm -hmm. Because there wouldn't be that many illegal people. People would be able to come legally, go back home legally, come back again. And so this is really something that, if it were us, I think we would consider. <laughs> Ich danke Ihnen ganz herzlich. Ich habe das Gefühl, wir sind am Anfang unseres Gesprächs, weil so viele Themen wir angesprochen haben. Und es ist äh, ein eben kompliziertes Feld. Ich danke Ihnen sehr für die Einsichten, die wir gewinnen konnten in Ihre Arbeit. Danke sehr. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Nächste Woche spreche ich mit Thomas Hürlimann über unsere Heimat und den Wert von Gipfelkreuzen. Aber auch darüber, warum es ihm neuerdings ausgerechnet Casanova angetan hat. Und falls Sie einmal bei einer Sendung hautnah mit dabei sein wollen, den nächsten philosophischen Stammtisch zeichnen wir im Lokal Sud in Basel auf, und zwar am 17. Oktober. Wir diskutieren, ob wir heute noch fliegen dürfen und was der Klimawandel Sie und mich moralisch angeht. Seien Sie live mit dabei, alle Infos finden Sie auf unserer Website. Jetzt gleich geht es hier weiter mit Nile Rogers. Vielleicht kennen Sie ihn nicht, aber Sie kennen sicher seine Musik. Mit Hits wie Le Freak oder We Are Family hat er nämlich Popgeschichte geschrieben. Viel Vergnügen und einen schönen Sonntag. <lacht>